She's looking right at me. Um, I have a couple of quick announcements this morning. Um, Rob, did you want to share one, or I don't know, you want to get him a, a mic, Aaron? And just while he's while he's getting that to him, um, there's still some boxes of offering envelopes at the back of the church. If you use offering envelopes, there's some with names still on them at the back. I think we've had some people missing because of the weather. Um, but there's also a couple of blank ones that Kathy put back there. Um, if you would like some, and and we didn't specifically put your name on some, there is more back there if you would like to use the offering envelopes. Uh, the last few weeks, um, there's been five or six times that either Kathy or Linda or I have come in and there's been a door open. Uh, more times than not, it's one of the front doors. Um, or lights left on. Um, so if you're in here, uh, and I have no problem with the build, building being used. I'm glad that it's being used. But if you're in here when you leave, please make sure you shut off lights, close any doors that were closed, lock any doors that should be locked. Um, all the doors in the basement, because all of those rooms are heated individually, I keep those closed so that they're only heating those doors. In fact, I, I close doors everywhere in here. Um, but as a result of keeping those closed, um, last time I saw our gas bill for last year was $3,000 less than the previous year. Um, so, you know, it, it's helping us save money by keeping doors closed. So if you're in here, just make sure you close doors, lock doors up, or if you see something that's out of place, I'd appreciate it if you'd help take care of it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, if you would uh, rise as you are able and, and join me in the call to worship this morning. <laughs> we gather to worship God. We are worshipers. We encounter the Word of God. We are disciples. We respond to the call of God. We are disciples. We celebrate at the table of God. We are we go to represent God. We are apostles. Let the glory of the Lord fill this place. Amen. Praise the Lord. We're now going to have an opening prayer, so we're switching things up a little bit this morning. So if you join me in prayer. Creative God, you make all things new in heaven and on earth. We come to you in a new year with new desires and old fears, new decisions and old controversies, new dreams and old weaknesses. Because you are a God of hope, we know that you create all the possibilities of the future. Because you are a God of love, we know that you accept all the mistakes of the past. Because you are the God of our faith, we enter your gates with thanksgiving and praise. We come into your presence with gladness and a joyful noise, and we serve and bless you. Amen. Let's worship. Glad. 
be seated. We'll continue in, in a time of prayer with one another. I want you to continue to have on your prayer list um, those people that are that are here on our list this morning. Um, Randy Dowdy as, as he heals for for Kathy's husband Dan, um, for for Shannon's dad Steve, for Gary for Jamie, um, for everyone else that's sick in our church. I think we're missing a lot of folks because of maybe they're traveling to warmer weather or uh, they're, they're staying inside out of the cold. But I think some people may be sick too. So be praying for our church family and those that are sick. Um, is there anyone else that we should have on our, on our prayer list that you'd like to share this morning? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, pray for Cameron. Um, for Tony and Kathy's grandson, Cameron. Anybody else like to share this morning? Pray for Carolyn for a safe travels to Saturday. Okay, driving through the snow from Montana to Indiana. Yeah. Okay. 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 Let's go to God in prayer. come to you this morning knowing that you are already here with us and we thank you for that that knowledge that awareness that you are always around us and that you are within us and we want to be more uh, Christian in our in our heart in our life more like Jesus that we would have a heart after your heart that that we would have a God shaped heart, uh, a God-focused heart, a God-honoring heart, and that we would just worship and, and praise you and adore you with all that we are, and that we would, we would demonstrate our love for you and, and the, the richness of the relationship that we have with you from the grace of yours that we've received, that that would just be a part of our, our every moment, our everyday life, that people would come to, to see it and, and they would see something different in our lives. They would see a, a love, a, a richness, a purity, a peace, a hope, a joy, and, and maybe that they would be curious and that we would be faithful and we would be willing and we would be brave to share our story and be able to, to welcome people into a relationship with you and, and introduce them to you and to your love and to your greatness and to your wonder. God, we pray for those this morning who are not with us. Um, we just pray for, for health and, and peace over them and we pray that um, they're not being able to, to worship with us and study with us this morning that that they would find another way to connect with with you and and with your people and and be encouraged and challenged this morning and we pray for those in in our church who are sick and we pray especially for those um, in our church family and our wider extended family who are who are suffering from, from cancer and, and from diseases and terminal illnesses. And we just pray for, for moments of joy in their life in the midst of pain um, and for uh, a peace that, that only you can provide for them and for their loved ones. 
And we pray that um, as we go out from this place later today, that we would take uh, a joy and a love with us that we could share with people that would warm their hearts and their souls and their spirits, even in the midst of the bitter winter cold. We pray that you would unite us together with you this morning and with one another and with Christians all over the place and throughout time as we pray the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Are you going to... All the kids that want to go downstairs, you can go downstairs this morning. And what are you, what are you learning downstairs this morning? Oh, it's a surprise. Oh, it's a surprise. That was a big smile. She likes surprises. Well, this morning, um, if you were here last Sunday, we did something a little bit different. We're going to do that again this morning, so you should have been forewarned, and, and, and next Sunday as well. But we're going to interact with God's Word this morning, but we're also going to interact with each other this morning as we're going through um, the Wesley Challenge, which is a group of, of questions that John Wesley, Charles Wesley, and, and some of their friends used um, for seven years, and then they ended up using in, in small groups all over the early Methodist movement. So before we do that, let's pray um, for the message. From the words of Psalm 19, 14. Let's, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So we've, we're, we're in the midst of just kind of a short, really three-week series, but using uh, these questions, uh, there's 21 that we're using, but there's 22 or 24 maybe historically um, that they've been using all over uh, the Methodist church and all the other, other churches that come from the Methodist movement. So this maybe has been used in small groups in free Methodist churches and Wesleyan churches and Nazarene churches. Um, but this is, a, this is a series of questions that were intended to use um, in a small, committed group of Christians that were meeting every single week. So usually in a small group format. So the, the first group this would have been used with is, is, was called the Holy Club. Um, and we don't, we're not seeking to be in Holy Club. But that's what the first group of men who banded together um, were calling themselves. So they were a group of students. Uh, Oxford University actually was started by John's brother Charles. Um, and, and, and Charles had gathered some young men together. And they wanted to grow in their faith. And, and these, these, are, these are men who are already, they were already reading Christian books. They were already reading their Bible. They were already praying together. You know, they were already going to, to worship every week. And they just hungered for more. They hungered for something deeper. And so they said, well, what if we got together every single week and, and we met and, and we prayed together and we, we dove into God's Word together and maybe we even shared what we're reading in some of these other Christian devotional books. And, and we just kind of offered an, a, an accountability to one another, a challenge and an encouragement to one another. So, so Charles started this group and then he, he contacted his older brother John who was teaching at the time. At, at Oxford, and, and he said, John, you want to help me with this group? Kind of lead this group? And John said, sure. And, and John started uh, using a series of kind of, these kind of probing questions, questions that you and I might think are kind of uncomfortable for someone to ask us. And, and as they used these questions, the questions, the group kind of contributed and the questions kind of evolved. And they ended up with a regular set of questions that they would move through on a regular basis. And these questions um, address their relationship with God. They address their relationship with their self and kind of their own uh, internal growth. And they also address their relationships with other people. So we're looking at those. And this week, we're going to look at some of the questions that kind of go inward. 
So last week we looked at a few questions and the challenge was to commit to an upward focus all year to think about our relationship with God. And the questions last week were these. Is Jesus real to me? Am I enjoying prayer? Do I insist upon doing something about which my conscience is uneasy? Did the Bible live in me today? Did I disobey God in anything? Do I pray about the money I spend? And do I give time for the Bible to speak to me every day? Okay, so this week, we're going to look at our relationship with ourself. So an inward focus. So the first question we might ask is, what does it mean to have an inward focus? What does it mean to have an inward focus? I would imagine that some people right now are already thinking negatively about that. Does anybody, I say, say, focus on yourself, have an inward focus. Does that immediately sound like something you would not hear in church? Maybe to some people? Yeah, we're talking about focusing on God, focusing on others, denying yourself, taking up your cross, right? Self language is usually bad. But an inward, inward focus. So what it really means is it means to, to, to challenge yourself to be honest with yourself and to consider the state and the quality of your soul. Consider the state and the quality of your interior life. What's really going on in your heart, in your mind, in your soul. So I'd like to share you uh, share with you a kind of longish, I'll call this longish quote from the Wesley Challenge book. Authentic followers of Jesus take the time to inspect their interior lives. Christians who seek to inspect their interior lives know that in order to most faithfully and effectively participate in God's mission, they must be healthily self-aware. Christians who are self-aware are those who do the hard work of introspection in order to mature and grow in their faith. Healthy, self-aware Christians are people who look deep into their soul reflect upon the truth and who they are truthfully becoming, and as a result of that realization, make the necessary changes to become who God created them to be. Wesley knew that in order to fully live into our God-intended design, we must be authentic people whose inner lives match our outer lives. And Wesley gave us seven questions that lead us toward determining our true self. In order to be real and true to our emerging faith, Christians must do hard work of becoming honest with themselves. In becoming honest with our true selves, it is important to remember that God loves us as we are. And we do not need to be ourselves up knowing that we have weaknesses and shortcomings. Instead, because we know our value and worth in God's eyes, we seek to become the people God intends for us to be. We do not earn God's love. It is freely given to us. Sometimes the hardest person for us to love is our own self. So self-reflection for the purpose of realizing your true self is hard work. Resist the temptation to move past it quickly and not truly search, but at the same time, resist the temptation to become defeated. Wesley's questions are meant to help us become who God intends for us to be. They're not intended to make us into people who are overwhelmed or conquered by self-hate and therefore unable to see our capability of a total love for God and others. In other words, as an authentic, committed Christian who hungers and thirsts for that deep relationship with God and for faithfully following Christ, we have to go inward. But we go inward in order that we might be able to go upward and in order that we might be able to go outward. We take an honest self-look, an honest self-appraisal of what's going on in our interior 
but so that it might serve our growing relationship with God, so that it might serve our growing love of other people. So I want to dive into a couple of Scripture passages this morning before we go to the questions. So I, I've printed them there. You can, you're welcome to open a Bible, but I've also printed them here in the bulletin for you. And these are the, the translations I'm going to read from. So this is from, from Romans. So Paul is writing to other Christians and he says, So then, my friends, because of God's great mercy to us, I appeal to you. Offer yourselves as a living sacrifice to God, dedicated to His service and pleasing to Him. It is the true worship that you should offer. Do not conform yourselves to the standards of this world, but let God transform you inwardly by a complete change of your mind. And then you will be able to know the will of God, what is good and is pleasing to Him and is perfect. So the first thing I want you to notice is that Paul doesn't immediately say, let's resolve to become better people. Let's, let's go inward and, and fix everything inside of ourselves and perfect ourselves. What he first says is he says, because of God's great mercy... Because of the grace you have already received, because of the love that God has already lavished upon you, because of every interaction that God initiated with you in your life in response to those things, then respond in worship to God. And this is the kind of worship you offer yourself as a living sacrifice. So Paul doesn't say offer your money. He doesn't say, uh, you know, these are... These are partly Jews that he's talking to, although he's talking to Gentiles as well, but sacrifice is, uh, is a cross-cultural thing in the ancient world. He's saying, he's saying, I'm not saying sacrifice an animal. I'm not saying bring money. I'm not saying bring your best possessions. I'm saying offer yourself as a living sacrifice to God, dedicated His service and pleasing to Him. This is true worship. But then he says, this is how I want you to go inward. This is what I mean by going inward. Is you are not going to transform yourself, but you're going to let God transform you. Which really means you're going to submit. You're going to surrender. Not you're going to resolve to make yourself better. You're going to put yourself in, in those places, in those situations, in those practices, in those disciplines. You're going to situate yourself where you're in a better place, a better posture to receive from God. To receive His Word, to receive His grace, to receive His love. And you're going to let God transform you. You're just going to be willing to be open. And then God's going to transform you from the inside out. And it's going to start with your mind. With your mind. You're going to think differently than the people around you. And you're going to let this happen so that you'll be able to know the will of God, what is good and pleasing to Him, what is perfect, what you need to know for the direction that we are headed. Because we're headed to a place after this life that's going to be a new creation. It's going to be a good and perfect creation without death, without sin, without darkness, without violence, without Satan, without any kind of evil. And you're going to need to be a new person in that place because you're going to have a perfect relationship with God and a perfect relationship with one another and a perfect relationship with all the creation and a perfect relationship with yourself because everything is going to be healed, restored, perfection. So there's an inward change that's going to need to take place. When Paul's writing to his friends, the Philippian church, he says, do everything without grumbling and arguing so that you may be blameless and pure, innocent children of God, surrounded by people who are crooked and corrupt. Among these people, you shine like stars in the world because you hold on to the word of life. What I want you to notice when Paul is writing here is he's talking, I want you to kind of see this progression so he says, you're going to be different, surrounded by people who are not like you. 
You're going to be surrounded by people who are crooked and corrupt. You're going to be surrounded by the everyday men and women that we meet all the time that live life without God. But you're going to be in the midst of them, not hiding off in the woods somewhere. You're going to be in the midst of those people, but you're going to be different. You're going to be blameless, pure, and innocent. How many people can say this morning you feel like you are blameless, pure, and innocent? Okay, me neither. Blameless, pure, and innocent children of God in the midst of these people. But look, he starts with that interior life. So the life uh, inside of me, and then the life inside of us, the community of faith, and then it goes outward into the life of how we interact with the people outside of the community of faith. And then we are, when we are among those people, we are to shine like stars because we hold true to the word of life. We hold true to Jesus every day. So there's this progression from the inward life to the outward life. From who we are inside to how we are going to interact with the people who are around us. First other Christians and then those outside. So now let's look at Jesus. What would Jesus say about our inward life? Well, Jesus was teaching and Jesus said... Why do you see that splinter that's in your brother or sister's eye, but you don't notice the log in your own eye, the two-by-four in your own eye, the oak tree sticking out of your own eye? How can you say to your brother or sister, let me take the splinter out of your eye when there's a log in your own eye? You deceive yourself. First take the log out of your eye, and then you'll see clearly to take the splinter out of your brother or sister's eye. So again, we kind of notice Jesus is saying, you are to have an influence on other people. You are to have an influence on other Christians, your brothers and sisters in Christ. You are to have an influence on those people outside of the community of faith. But it needs to start actually not with immediately going out and helping them with their sins and their failings and their faults, but actually by first going inward and realizing how warped I am at my own center, how uh, full of uh, propensity and, and a desire to sin I am, the darkness inside of me, which is hard to accept and hard to face. Because, otherwise, if I don't do that first, then I'm not really being changed and transformed. So then when I go to other people, I'm not really a good witness. Because I say that I have a relationship with God, but that supposed relationship I have hasn't actually transformed me or made me any better. So then I look like... And I think we see this quite a bit today in our country. But the Christians look just like the non-Christians. And there's not really anything different than a label that I've slapped on myself. So, so as, a, as someone who, who doesn't have a relationship with God, who, who, who doesn't you know, ascribe to believe in, in Jesus Christ and His life, death, and resurrection, who doesn't say, yeah, he's, he's not king, or at least He's not king of my life, I'm looking at a Christian and I'm saying, I don't, your life looks just like mine. And not, it looks just like mine because you also watch the same movies I do or you drink a beer, but it looks, it looks just like mine because your marriage is just as messed up as mine is. Your, your business dealings are, are full of selfishness or, or lies. You're, you, you're full of uh, depression and anxiety, and I knew you 10 years ago before you knew Jesus, and you had that before too, and, and you're kind of a miserable complainer, grumbler, and you were 10 years ago too. How has this made any difference in your life? And so we have to be careful. Because we can unintentionally offer a life to other people that actually isn't the Christian life. Because we've never gone inward. 
or we've never actually allowed God to really go deep into those kind of dark recesses, those caverns of our heart, and change anything. So here are the questions that John and Charles and their brothers would, would give to us. If we're going to turn inward in order to turn upward, if we're going to turn inward in order to turn outward, if we're going to take this time in our relationship with God, here's some questions. So the first question for our inward focus is, am I proud? Am I full of pride? Am I full of arrogance? Uh, when I wrote on this question on, on Monday... Um, and when I kind of was reflecting on it myself, I was thinking not, not all pride is bad. We usually talk about pride in the church as being bad because we've been talking for 2,000 years about a certain type of pride. But it's not that God doesn't ever want you to be proud in terms of like happy and self-satisfied with, with any of your relationships or anything that you've ever done or achieved. But it's kind of that out-of-bounds pride it's what I would call unholy pride. Am, am I so proud to the sense that I'm ignoring my own faults? Or am I so proud of, to the sense that I'm ignoring the need that I have for God? That deep need and His perfection? Or am I so proud that uh, in my mind I think that I'm about perfect and everyone else is just kind of like dirt? Am I defeated in any part of my life? Again, I don't think it's wrong for, for us to feel defeat in our life. I think that's part of a natural state of our unnatural existence, the fact that we live in a world that is plagued by sin and death and decay. But you might ask the question, am I remaining defeated in any part of my life? Is there any part of my life, we could keep going with that question, is there any part of my life that I'm not letting God heal? You know, I think we sometimes need to learn to praise our healer and not our hurts. Sometimes we define ourselves by our hurts. Am I remaining defeated in any part of my life? Am I just letting um, a bitterness exist, a resentment just go on? Am I just letting uh, a certain part of my life, am I letting myself continue to be beat down in such a way that I, I'm not really living into how God sees me because I, I just can't let up on myself. I can't give myself any grace. Do I go to bed on time and get up on time? That sounds like a question that mom or dad would ask you right when you go to college. Are you going to bed on time? Or are you getting up on time? Do I go to bed on time and get up on time? It's a question about our use of time. It's a question about our discipline. It's a question about whether we're getting the rest that we should. So again, it's an inward focus. I hope you can see that question. An inward focus that affects our upward focus and our outward focus. If, I, if I'm not answering yes to that question, and not that we should all have the same bedtime and get up time, but if I'm answering that question with, no, I really have no discipline in how I sleep, well, I wonder if I have any discipline in the rest of my life. How does that affect my relationship with God? Or if I really never rest, I really never sleep, I really never take a break, I'm just go, go, go all the time, what are my, what are my interactions with other people like? So the inward kind of affects the upward and the outward. Do I grumble and complain constantly? I got the most responses on Facebook to that question this week. I, I guess we, there must be other people around me that are grumbling and complaining or wrestling with grumbling and complaining. But again, it's not... These questions are not to, to say, um, I, must, I must put on this image that I'm perfect. I must put on this allure that I have no problems. You know, I must always have positive speak even though I'm rotting inside because I can't express any of my emotions. It's not that. It's, is my life so consumed with negativity and bitterness that I'm just always grumbling and complaining all the time? And those closest to us could probably tell us whether that's true. Am I a slave to dress, 
to friends, to work, to habits. And we maybe could put even a line there that says, insert another noun. Are we a slave to any person, place, thing, or idea that's, that's not Christ? Do I let things, possessions, or people, or, or ideas, or, or habits so consume my thoughts that I'm just thinking about them all the time, I let them influence me, my whole life is structured around them? You know, what's, what's the real... What's the real priority? Sometimes I'm a slave to the plan. I'm a planner. And I'm a slave to the plan. And I can't let the plan go. So this thing happened in uh, our marriage within the last year. I make Jen nervous. Um, where we were going to go see a movie. And we had to go, we we're going to go to Terre Haute to see the movie. And... Uh, we were looking at times, and we were supposed to get out the door at a certain time to be able to get to the theater at a certain time to be able to get, you know, you don't know how long the line's going to be to get, you know, the tickets, and then you got to stay in another line to get the pop and the, and, the, and, the, and the snacks, and then, you know, both have to go to the bathroom to make sure, you know, and then you go to the theater, and then you want to get a good seat. Okay, right? So there's a, there's a time we've got to leave the house, okay? And this has happened to us so many times. So we are not leaving the house at the time that we need to leave the house to make this movie time, right? And so we got in the car, and we were fighting. And, uh, and this, is, this is something that we're supposed to be doing together because it's fun on a day off, good for our marriage. And we're, we're about to fight for the next 40 minutes on our way to the theater. And we realized, oh my goodness, what are we doing and so we actually made a decision. We stopped it. We turned around and went back home. Decided not to go see a movie. Because we were actually going to make our... We were actually do damage to our relationship just to make sure that we got to go see this movie at the right time. At the right time. So you can be a slave to... I can be a slave to my plans sometimes. How do I spend my spare time? And you might laugh and you might go, I don't, I don't even know what spare time is. Um, how do you spend your non-working time or the, the time that you have a lot of control over? How do you spend your flexible time? And again, I don't think this is a question that, that they were asking one another just to say, you know, is there anything that you should not be doing? Are you spending any of your time out at the, out at the bar or something? But just how do you spend your spare time? Are you spending it intentionally? Do you know what you're doing with your spare time? Are you spending any of your spare time for your own good, for your own health, for your relationship with God, for your relationship with your, those people who are, most, who are closest to you? Am I self-conscious, self-pitying, or self-justifying? Um, when I think of the, the word self-pitying, uh, a song comes to mind. Does anybody know the, the rock artist uh, Warren Zevon? Anybody? You know, the song Werewolves of London? Anybody know that song? Okay. Um, he did another song, and I think it might have been a cover, so I might be aging myself because it's even, even older than that. But his song is, uh, and, the, and the, the chorus is, Poor, poor, pitiful me. Poor, poor, pitiful me. Okay. So I think of that whenever I hear self-pitying. Just, it's, it's really, really kind of self-focused. Poor, poor, pitiful me. All the time. Self-justifying is, I am willing and ready at all times to argue with you to defend the fact that I never do anything wrong. Um, self-conscious is just... Self-conscious is so like self-awareness is good and self-conscious kind of sounds like self-awareness. But I think self-conscious is, is am I so anxious that, that I can never focus on anyone but myself? So, so these are some difficult questions to ask ourselves. So here's what, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do the same thing that we did last week. While everybody stand up. Stand up. I heard a grumble right then. <laughs> Stand up and stretch out. I'll be nice to you. You can even just stay by your spouse this week. But get in a group of two or three people, and I want you to pick two of these questions and just talk about two of these questions for a minute. So you can, you can reach for low-hanging fruit or you can pick a difficult question, but pick two questions, talk with two or three people right by you just for a few minutes.
but it makes me all the way to steal. So now I have devotion to this program. Selfless. So that is my devotion to Okay, let's come back together. If you have a hard time with any of these questions, I think that's okay. I had, I had a hard time with, I mean, if I'm really going to uh, honestly spend time with each question um, this week, uh, as I was, I, I realized I actually could have a difficult time with every one of these questions. Um, depends on how deep we're going to go. <laughs> um, I think that's true kind of in all of our, all of our devotions. Sometimes there's a temptation to just get it done. Um, 
You might have just like a, you know, a, a Bible verse and a 150 word devotion sent to your phone or something, or you might open up your Bible and you just, you read a short, short passage and in 10 minutes you're done or something like that. But if we're really going to spend time, invest time in our, in our kind of devotional life, in this, in this inwardness with, with God, um, we can spend a long time there. And sometimes um, it, can, it can be difficult to go through some of these questions. So, I want to encourage you to, to, do, to do this kind of thing on your own. Um, if you don't do it already, or if you do, be encouraged, um, because I think it's important. I would also encourage you to, um, when you have that devotional time, intentionally invite the Holy Spirit into that space. Um, it's like, like God doesn't really need an invitation, but I'm sure He likes to get one. You know what I mean? Um, so here's some things that, that we could do to go further. So you can take these home. You can include these questions in your daily devotional time, maybe this week. Um, if you'd like to, to read some more reflections on these questions, you can get a, the book. It's called The Wesley Challenge. Um, I've been, as I've been going through these questions, I've been putting stuff on Facebook. If you want to kind of read um, what, what, where my thought has been. Um, and, and then I've been including a daily challenge at the end of each of those posts, but I'm actually just taking that right from the book usually. And you could find a partner to study, dialogue, pray, and grow with. Um, I know some of us are already in small groups or Bible studies or uh, Sunday school. But sometimes those, those, those gatherings are too big, really, to kind of be um, intimate, or there maybe there's not enough time. Um, these are the kind of things that really shouldn't be rushed. And so whether it's a, a spouse or a close friend um, or something like that, you might just get together and, and maybe even like once a week or something, check in and say, like, how, how is your devotional life? Um, are, you getting, are you getting anything out of it? Are you hearing anything from God? Uh, what do you What do you do? Do you Do you journal? Are you Are you working through a book of the Bible where you just read a chapter every day? Um, are you following a guided devotional? You know that kind of thing. So here's the challenge for your relationship with yourself: challenge yourself to go inward once each day in a quiet, solitary place. Be bold. Inspect the interior. Search your thoughts, your actions, and your feelings. Invite the Spirit into your midst and tell God that you desire to meet with Him and tell Him out loud. Be honest with yourself and with your God. Commit to the hard work of self-examination so that you might grow and mature as God desires. Ask God to reveal how He sees you, how He loves you, and how He is changing you for the better. So if you'd like to kind of accept this challenge head on this morning, this is a good uh, Wesleyan Methodist question. They'd ask each other, how is it with your soul? Which I think is a funny question. And my pastor friend Clark, um, we, have to, we have to submit a, a form every year that kind of talks about our own devotional life and stuff like that to, to other pastors. And um, he, this is the last question on the form, and he always answers it as well. Um, but he hasn't gotten in, in, in trouble for it yet. But we, we should answer maybe more than it is, it is well. How, how is it with your soul? That's really what we're talking about this morning. So if you want to accept the challenge head on this morning, what we're really talking about, we're talking about providing place for confession. So I'm going to take a few minutes um, for each of us just kind of in silence to think about if there's anything that we need to confess to God this morning. Um, and then we'll, we'll go through a, a prayer of confession together. So I'm just going to give us uh, just a couple of minutes.
I don't want to rush anybody, but why don't we do this prayer together? We confess to you, all-knowing God, what we are. We are not the people we like others to think we are. We are afraid to admit, even to ourselves, what lies in the depths of our souls. But we cannot hide our true selves from you. You know us as we are, and yet you love us. Help us not to shrink from self-knowledge. Teach us to respect ourselves for your sake. Give us the courage to put our trust in your guiding power. Raise us out of the paralysis of guilt into the freedom and energy of forgiven people. And for those who through long habit find forgiveness hard to accept, we ask you to break their bondage and set them free. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. This is the declaration of forgiveness. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, and that proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. I'm going to take an offering this morning. If I could have uh, ushers come forward. Let's offer these gifts up to the Lord together. Creator of the universe, we thank you for the gift of life you've entrusted in us. Guard our hearts and attitudes that we may see as you see. Help us find security in you and free us from the need to feel superior. Let us see our place in your kingdom and humble ourselves before our brothers and sisters. Amen. Remain standing and we'll join together. We can answer that question, how is it with your soul, with it as well.
charged this week to, to accept the challenge to go inward each day. And I hope that um, these questions and maybe our, our conversation this morning will be of uh, in challenge but also encouragement to you in your daily walk with Christ. So here the blessing. This is again the, the blessing from Numbers chapter 6. The Lord bless you and protect you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His face to you and grant you peace. Go in God's peace. Amen. Thank you.